At Mercy Village Church, we are loving, abiding, and going. That's how we state our core values concisely. But each of those three core values is stated in its own robust sentence that gets at the fuller meaning. So in this sermon series titled Roots and Fruits, we're examining each of our core values and the why and the what behind each one. This content comes from Mercy Village Church in Barbersville, West Virginia, and you can learn more at www.mercyvillage.church. We're launching into a new sermon series, uh, Roots and Fruits. Now, uh, primarily, uh, the way that we will do uh, preaching at Mercy Village Church will be through books of the Bible. And even when we're not preaching through books of the Bible, the vast majority of our sermons will be still, at least by uh, most definitions of it, expository preaching. They will be through at least passages of the Bible. This series will be one of those. We will go through multiple passages, although we will not be going through a specific book. But we will preach through those passages verse by verse, and in doing so, get after our core values. And so that is the direction that we're headed. Uh, Over the summer, uh, maybe it was late spring actually, we were preparing for some um, landscaping. And one of the ways that uh, we saved money was we did all the demolition, if you will, uh, by ourselves. And so we took out the old plants and, and that sort of thing. There was a tree, though, that needed to come down. And uh, I inherited a chainsaw uh, from my mother-in-law because she's oftentimes far more manly than I am. And uh, so she... The big red truck I drive is hers, too. Anyway, so uh, the chainsaw wasn't working, though. And uh, David, my friend David, was over one uh, Sunday afternoon, and they stayed into the evening. And after dinner, we started working on the chainsaw, and we got it fixed. And the thing got cranked up and going, and I said, well, I'm going to take that tree down. So I go out there, and I start chopping down the tree with the chainsaw, when all of a sudden my wife, loving not only our family, but also our neighbors, which I had failed to do, comes out to remind me that it's not it's after 9 p.m. in the evening. This is probably not the best activity to uh, curry the favor of our neighbors to have the chainsaw going after 9 p.m. However, that was not the real work of the job. That was everything that was above the ground that came down that night. But I still had to deal with what was underneath. I had to deal with the roots. That required a lot more work, which I didn't do after 9 p.m. And so we cut those roots with an axe and with uh, one of those giant bars that prize things. And we got up under there and then we hitched the truck to it. And finally, we ripped that thing out of the ground. You see, there's obviously two parts to a tree. There's the roots and there's the fruits. Now, you can have years where fruit trees don't bear fruit. There's uh, a crab apple orchard at the family farm, my wife's family farm. The fruit is above the ground. You see it there, but obviously the roots are beneath. Now, sometimes trees will fail to bear fruit. And And that doesn't always mean that the roots are bad. But one thing you can be sure of is that if the roots are bad, there's absolutely no way that that tree will bear fruit. Sometimes even when it fails to bear fruit, that can be a sign that the roots are beginning to go bad. Roots are important. So when we put our core values together, we wanted them to encompass not just the fruit, a lot of core values for churches will talk about who we want to be, what we want to look like as the people of God, and that's good. But for us, we wanted to write them in a way that it encompassed not just the the fruit of us living for Jesus, but the root as well. So our core values stated in the more catchy way is just that we are loving, abiding, and going. But if you were to read them in their full extent, we are loved by God, and we will love God fully and love people selflessly. That's the root, loved by God, and the fruit. The next one, we are invited by Jesus. That's the root, and we will abide with him communally. You don't get to abide with Jesus unless he invites you into community with him. But he has. 
And that root leads to the fruit. And then we are empowered by the Holy Ghost and we will go outward boldly. Our boldness going out in, in, in response to the Great Commission is rooted in the fact that the Holy Spirit has been given to us. And so those are the things we're going to get after in the coming weeks. Get after those core values. And so today we're going to start with the first. The root of why we love God and we love others. And so we're going to go to Romans chapter 8, which is one of my favorite chapters in all of the Bible. We're going to go to verses 31 through 39, which are some of my favorite verses in all of the Bible. It hasn't even been a year since I preached through these verses. It probably may not be more than a year before I return to them again. They're some of my favorites. I think this is one of the most important things that we can get today is this. We are loved by God, period. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. And you say, well, thanks, Captain Obvious. I've known that since Sunday school. Well, back off for a second. Have you watched the way you live? Have you watched the way I live? Have you paid attention to the way you feel? Have you paid attention to the way I feel? You see, I think that the way I live sometimes and the way I feel sometimes would betray that I don't necessarily believe that with all my heart. That I still need reminded of this truth. That I haven't graduated from the class of God loves you. That that may be one of the most foundational lessons that I can take into my heart again and again and again. So that's where we start today with those roots. Yeah, Mark Sayers, who is a uh, kind of a, uh, he's a pastor in Australia, but he, he writes and speaks a lot about uh, culture and how Christians counterculturally enter into the cultures that they're in wherever they are throughout history and, and time. And one of the things he says is that anxiety is the canary in the coal mine. So we're all from West Virginia. We get that reference, I'm sure, that those those canaries in the coal mines, when uh, the air was unhealthy, they would sound the alarm or they would die. <laughs> and then when they died, you would know, trouble, we need to get out of here. He says anxiety is the canary in the coal mine that says we don't understand the world the way we're supposed to. We don't understand God's love the way that we're supposed to. Our worldview has something missing. And I would go further. I would say there's all kinds of canaries in the coal mine. There's insecurity and pride and self-loathing and fear and anger and depression and hate and greed and slothfulness and dissatisfaction. And the list could go on. Those are just my things. You got your stuff too. And these canaries in the coal mine are the alarm that we don't get this. We're not living as if we believe this in the core of our souls, that we are loved by God, period. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. So that's what we're getting after today. When we went through Compelling Community the other night, um, one of the quotes that I'd had highlighted in there was, our love is proportional to our understanding of forgiveness. In other words, if the fruit of our love is going to be made manifest to the world around us, then we must understand God's love for us, in particular how he has forgiven us of our sins. No passage, in my opinion, gets after the love of Jesus more than Romans chapter 8. So Father, what we know not today, please teach us. What we are not, please make us. And what we have not, please give us. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. A look at four roots all encompassing this same thing, right? Like, you know, like a giant root will grow down and then all those roots will kind of shoot off of it. So that giant root of loved by God has these roots shooting off of it that we see here in Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 31. And we got a lot of kids in here, so I'm going to risk being cheesy and hope that it comes out memorable. But this will help us remember God's love when I say something cheesy like God's love is better than vibranium. That's what we're going to see in the first two verses. Okay, so if you're familiar with uh, the fake world of Marvel, then you know about vibranium, which isn't a real thing. But it is stronger, right? 
and indestructible than almost anything. That's a Captain America shield is made out of that. Again, we're in fake a fake world right now, but but that's the power of it. There are very few things, if anything, that can stand against it. And in Romans 8.31, we, we read these words. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? That there is a there is something in God's love that, for us that is so powerful that in the wake of it, the children of God are in a place where nothing can stand against them. But what are these things he talks about? Because that's how he starts. What then shall we say to these things? I think that matters. Certainly the very immediate context, verses 28 through 30, are pretty awesome. We'll get to them here in just a second. Certainly the the context of the chapter, which has some really good things in it. Some would argue that specifically it's about chapters 5 through 8 because of the themes that are in that. I would make the argument, and many other scholars would too, that it's the whole book of Romans up to this point. There's some really great things in Romans. If you've never read it, you should. Chapter 1 starts with where chapter 8 uh, 31 is going to get us that we're loved by God, which is shocking because chapters one through three is all about how depraved and, and sinful we are. And yet God loves us anyway. In verse four, it pivots that there's a righteousness outside of ourselves that is revealed. And, and, and that's Jesus. And it's and it's revealed to us. He is revealed to us in chapter four In chapter four. It goes on to say that by faith alone and chapter five, by faith alone, we're reconciled to God chapter 6 through 8 we are indwelt by the spirit of God and then when you get into chapter 8 it just starts to crescendo that there is no condemnation for the children of God that the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead gives us life that we are adopted as children of God crying out Abba Father that we are chosen by God justified by God sanctified by God and one day we will be glorified by God and as he comes to that right he's written all of this and I can see him there I don't know what his spirit was like but if I've written all this I've got one hand raised in worship the non-pen hand as I begin to write verse 31 if all of this is true about Jesus if all of these promises are true that God has made to his children then what do we say to these things We've just skimmed the surface of Romans. There's there's so much more in there, but all of these things belong to the children of God. Uh, If you're familiar with uh, the name uh, Nate Saint or, um, man, it just went out of my brain, the missionaries to Ecuador who were there and were killed uh, uh, in the Amazon jungle as they went to, um, Jim Elliott, as they went to share the gospel with people there. One of the men that was involved in the killings, his name was Minkai. It's a great story. Uh, Nate Saint, the son of Steve Saint, or Steve Saint, the son of Nate Saint, went back and shared the gospel with the people who had killed his father. And uh, Minkai was one of the ones who believed. He ends up coming to America several times to, to share the story of what God has done in his life. It's beautiful. One of the funnier things that happens, but it's pointed for us today, is that his very first time going into a grocery store, he stands there and he looks around at all the produce and all the food in this grocery store. He's coming from the Amazon jungle, right? Straight in to America. And he says, whose is all this food? Like, what in the world is... Who in the world does all this belong to? I mean, we can't imagine our minds being blown like that because we go into grocery stores all the time. Who is mine? We should come to Romans that way. We should look at all these things. Those are my, Those are available to me? That's Minkai. I can get any of this stuff? Yeah. All of these things are for the children of God. And so he asked the question... If this is true, what then do we say? Well, if God is for us, who can be against us? Right? God's love is better than vibranium. Nothing can stand against it. Not a thing. If God's love is for us, how, who can be against us? 
I found this quote interesting too. The guy's name is John Christentum. He uh, was an archbishop at Constantinople. He said, yet those that be against us, so far are they from thwarting us at all, that even without their will, they become to us the causes of crowns and procurers of countless blessings, in that God's wisdom turneth their plots into our salvation and glory. See how really no one is against us? Not only do those who come against you fail, to come against you, but their schemes and plots and plans will be turned by a gracious God to be for your glory and for your your good. And the proof he offers in verse 32, he goes straight to the top. We could offer proofs from our lives of times where we have seen that God is for us and that nothing could stand against us. But he goes to the biggest proof. He says, he who did not spare his own son, verse 32, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Our heavenly father, infinitely rich, gave his most precious possession, his son, to be crucified on behalf of sinners like me and sinners like you. And if he would give up his most prized possession, will he not then follow through and give us everything else that he has promised? That's the proof. Have you thought about that? We are rooted in the fact that God's love, nothing can stand against it. Nothing can stand against it. This kind of love will give you courage. Right? If nothing can stand against you, then you can be courageous, as we'll get into in the next couple weeks, in how we love God and how we love others. Nothing can stand against it. We could stop here. I mean, I mean, think about that. We could just, you know, some of you are like, yeah, I wish we would. But, but, the, but Paul goes on. Verse 33, who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. God's love is better than Teflon. Nothing sticks to it. So this is legal talk by the Apostle Paul. When you commit a crime, charges can be brought against you. A criminal uh, can have charges brought against them, and then in court they will figure out if those charges are for real or not. And if they're truly guilty uh, and there's enough proof, the charges will stick. That's how they talk about it. And they'll be uh, sentenced to whatever the punishment is. What God says through Paul is the charges can't stick against the children of God because it's God who justifies. So who can bring a charge against me? That's the way the question's posed. And you might think, well, plenty. Like Satan, he's the accuser of the brethren. That's one of his titles. He's going to bring charges against me. People in my life have brought charges against me. They've told me I'm not good enough. I don't have what it takes. Maybe you still have those voices rattling around in your head. Your social social media feed will uh, accuse you. You're not pretty enough. You're not uh, creative enough. You're not uh, you're not active enough. Whatever. You'll be accused. Your own conscience will accuse you. The point isn't that accusations won't come. The point is that accusations won't stick. God's love is is better than Teflon. So when your heart tells you that you're alone, when your heart tells you that you're not good enough, when your heart tells you that Jesus doesn't love you, that God has given up on you, what Paul is saying, those charges can't stick. And he roots it in the fact that it is God who justifies. That's verses 29 and 30. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. That means he's made us right, he's made us right with God. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. And so because of that, right, because of that promise, because of that truth, because of us being made right with God, you may be accused by any number of sources that those charges won't stick. Jesus is enough and his work is finished. Uh, With confidence in God's word, not dismissively. Like, let me be real. I still hear 
in my heart and mind throughout my 36 years, even from when I was younger, the words that people brought have brought against me. Some of them I can still feel very close to the core of my heart, so I don't say this dismissively. I say this with full confidence in God's word that the that the the truth of this old hymn is true for the children of God. Well may the accuser roar of sins that I have done. I know them all and thousands more. Jehovah knoweth none. That's the point of verse 33. That no matter what the accusers say, the charges don't stick. God's love is better than Teflon. Love like that will make you confident, right? Or make you continue, continuing, continuing in, in following after Jesus even when you get it wrong, even when you mess up, even when you fall down. You can pick yourself back up. The Lord can pick you up and you can keep going. Number three, God's love is, is better than platinum. And in that sense, it's that it can't be corroded. It can't be rusted, right? Like that's the thing about it. That's what makes it valuable is that it can't, it's not susceptible to rust or, or uh, condemnation. There's nothing about it that can, can be eroded or corroded. Verse 34, who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. There is no condemnation. First verses of chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. This is huge. There is no condemnation for the children of God. That matters. That matters in a world, right? As ever, you know, there's a million things that, that are around you that are going to make you feel that you're condemned. But he offers up this instead. He says, Jesus died for your justification. That's something you can bank on. You're righteous, you're innocent before God, and innocent people can't be condemned. 34 goes on to talk about how Jesus was raised from the dead. The ultimate condemnation is death. Jesus overcame that in the resurrection. And now he sits at the right hand of God the Father interceding for us. This is missed often too in my life. That when you mess up, when you're not good enough, when you miss your quiet time for two months straight, you haven't even picked up your Bible, and you think, right, because of being raised in Bible Belt Appalachia, that now all of a sudden God's a little bit frustrated with you. Yeah. And you wait to pick up your Bible because, well, yeah, God doesn't really care that I do this. Or you can't pray, right? Because, you know, some sin, or you were angry at your kids maybe this day, or you said something, you know, and you, I mean, that, am I the only one? Right, that has that ingrained into his way of living, that if I'm not right with God, I, I can't approach God. Like that legalism, that weight of that condemnation is on me. But Jesus sits there next to the Father, and every time you mess up, Jesus is like, hey, remember, I died for that sin. I died for her jealousy and her dissatisfaction. I died for uh, his lack of faith. I, I died for his fear-driven anger. I died for that. And he intercedes for us. And therefore, there is no condemnation. So we're three roots in. And we're already encouraged. Paul's about to start singing. He's going to sing about the love of God. And it's beautiful. And, this is, and that will be our crescendo for today. But remember... When you feel that there's a lot standing against you, God's love is stronger than anything that comes against you. You may be blasted with accusations from within yourself and from outside of yourself, but God's love is, is, is the kind of love that keeps those accusations from sticking. And you may feel like you're drowning in voices of condemnation. But God's love and in light of the death of Jesus and resurrection of Jesus, there's no condemnation. And maybe that doesn't feel real to you right now. 
We'd be like, yeah, that sounds too good to be true. There's no condemnation for that either. For that doubt. Now Paul's been building to this. And I like to think that maybe he didn't even know how clung to these words would be that he was about to write. Maybe he did. Maybe he finished writing it and dropped the pen and was like, well, now that was good. I don't know. These next words are so good. Uh, the, the, the thing I came up with, this is interesting to me, God's love is better than Dello, so I ner- nerded out this week. I want to know what the strongest adhesive in the world is. This blew my mind. The strongest adhesive in the world is capable of list- lifting 17.5 tons. Tons. Right, so they get the crane out, and they get this big truck, and they put all this extra concrete on it till it weighs seventeen point five tons. And then instead of like welding the metal parts together, they just glue them to the hooks, and uh, they pick up the truck. <laughs> I'm serious. This is, everybody else is like fine with this. That's that's witchcraft. I'm not. I'm not okay. That's insane. That's wild. So the glue held 17.5 tons, and that glue was called Dello. But the point is, God's love is unbreakable. It's stronger than that. There is nothing in this world that can separate us from the love of God. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine or nakedness, or danger, or sword. He gives you some excuses already. right? Like with the other ones, he says, who is to condemn, but he doesn't list anybody that can. Who will stand against you, but he doesn't list anyone that will. But here he, he, he starts helping you think of your own excuses. Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. And then he doesn't answer the question. You expect him just to give a resounding no, but instead... He quotes from the Psalms. He quotes Psalm 42, 22. As it is written, For your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. He says, yeah, famine, tribulation, nakedness, sword, danger. They will come against you. Right? Like you will have suffering. God's love doesn't keep those things from coming against you. The point is, will they be able to separate you from the love of God? And that's when he writes these words that are so famous. Regardless of what comes against you, know in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. I love the last part because I know how my mind works. When he says, who will accuse you, I think of who will. When he says, who will condemn you, I think of who will. When he says, who will stand against you, I think of who will. Now he says, who will separate you from the love of God? And he lists, boom, 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 boom. Will it be any of these things? And then at the end, he says, nor anything else in all creation. Because he knows people like me are going to look at that list and say, well, you forgot to mention this and you forgot to mention that. And he says, well, I'd cover it with this. Nothing else in all of creation will be able to separate you from the love of God. Paul goes even further. Not only can nothing separate you from the love of Christ, that could be passive. We just kind of sit here and nothing separates us from the love of God. No, his love makes us conquerors, more than conquerors, victorious over anything that comes our way. Not only do we win in the end, but God turns all of our suffering and trials and tribulations. He he turns everything that comes against us, every accusation, every condemnation leveled against us, every bit of suffering leveled against us, he redeems it for our good and for his glory. That's beautiful. Ray Ortland gave me this idea in his book just called Gospel. He paints this picture. He says, imagine in heaven 10 million years in and I walk up to you and I say, hey, remember, just based on our context, remember when so-and-so got COVID-19? And those weeks were like super rough and, and we thought that this might be be the end and and we were scared to death you remember that and you very well 10 million years into eternity might look back at me and say 
Remind me again what COVID-19 was. I don't remember. That in the presence of God, with everything redeemed and made right before him, that insert any trauma. What was cancer? What was anxiety? What was family separation? What was fear? What was poverty? What was death? Can you even fathom what it will be like to live for what we would measure as 10 million years in the presence of Jesus with everything perfect? That's the future reality because of God's love. God's love is inseparable. Our present reality will never separate us from the love of God. God is for us. One day our present reality will be of no consequences. None except to prove that God was faithful to his promises. And that his love was unstoppable. And that's beautiful. Nobody can stand against you. Nobody can accuse you. Nobody can condemn you with any weight that matters. And the love that accomplishes these things, no one can separate you from it. My fear with a sermon like this is that we chalk it up, as I said from the beginning, as elementary. It's not. This is the whole thing. If it doesn't start here, if we think we've graduated from this, if we think we no longer need to bask in this and, and, and wade in this and swim in this, then we're mistaken. The love of God is the root to any fruit of us walking with Christ. And our confidence is not in us, but in the finished work of Jesus on the cross. In 2 Corinthians 3, Paul gives that reminder that our confidence, which we have through Christ towards God, not that we're sufficient in and of ourselves to claim anything from coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God. That love of God towards us, proven at the cross through Jesus, is the root of of everything that we'll talk about in the next six weeks. It's at the root. But that love had a cost. It wasn't free. It came through the finished work of Jesus on the cross. Greater love has no man than this, that he would lay down his life for his friends. The love cost Jesus his life. That's the proof of his love for you. And that's our confidence. We are loved by God in a way that nothing can touch it, nothing can destroy it, nothing can separate us. It begins there. So how do we respond? If you're not a Christian, trust Jesus today. You can be confident in his love for you only through Jesus. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Simple verse. But what that means is you put your faith, your belief, just like you believe that chair is going to hold you up, you got some faith when you sat down in it. You believe that the finished work of Jesus on the cross is enough to bring you into a relationship with God that you could never get into by yourself. If you believe in Jesus like that, you'll be saved. You become part of his family. That love that you cannot be separated from can be yours today. Child of God, stay rooted. I don't know how we each individually will do that specifically, but there are time-tested ways. The Word of God, prayer, fasting. These aren't just spiritual disciplines that when you don't do them, you're supposed to feel guilty. No, these are ways to root yourself deeply in who God is. So turn the TV off. Pick up your Bible. Put your phone down. Memorize Scripture. Read books about uh, the Gospel. Turn down the news. Turn up worship music. Root yourself deeply in the love of God. It changes everything. These next two sermons about how we respond as people who love God and love others will be impossible without this root. We are loved by God. Period. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. And this changes everything. 
Father, help us to stay rooted. I've struggled with this all week. It feels elementary. It feels over overtaught. But what I know is that it has not been over grasped by my soul. That I don't believe it like I need to believe it. I don't believe it like I should believe it. And if there's to be any change in my life, if there's to be any fruits of love, then I must be rooted in your love. And so root us deeply individually and uh, communally and as Mercy Village Church in your love. By your good grace. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Thanks for listening, and if you haven't already, we would love for you to join the work of God as Jesus builds Mercy Village Church. You can learn more at our website at www.mercyvillage.church.